No, I don't think so. Not from this end. I hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to go ahead on the assumption that you can hear me, folks. And um, so I, I want to welcome you all to the legislative panel. Um, I first want to thank the member organizations of uh, Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights for making this happen. And I especially want to thank the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council for their financial support and for their for programmatic support yeah. of our efforts. Um, um, I uh, want to thank our guest panelists, or I should say at this point, guest panelists, um, <laughs> Uh, who've agreed to share their perspectives and who will join us in what I think will be uh, an exciting and respectful discussion of the issues of the day as we find ourselves in the second half of the legislative session. Um, our Disability Awareness Day theme, and I, maybe I should say Awareness Days because we'll have things going on at different times. Uh, our theme is especially apt these days, justice and access for all more important now than ever. And I think behind everything we do these days is the realization of the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on just about everything we can name. On the technical side of things, Stephanie Monty will be helping with keeping things going smoothly. And so feel free to message her directly in the chat if you have questions. Um, Safakor Kamambu Pamei will be monitoring the chat box for questions since I can only keep track of one thing at a time and I'm lucky if I can do that very well. Um, she'll, she'll keep me posted with uh, questions that may come in uh, when we get to that time in the, in the program. Uh, so put your questions in, in the chat. Um, now, except for our panelists, it would be helpful to the interpreter if you'd keep your video turned off once we get started, uh, unless you're speaking. And certainly, you know, if, if you have a question and it's, you know, you get acknowledged um, and, and go ahead and use the raise hand function um, or flip your video on and, and wave if you do have a question um, when we get to that part of the program. Um, uh, it works better for the interpreter. Um, for us for that to have the as few of the faces actually showing as is as is possible um and we'll get that uh we'll keep that going as as we can also i want you to remember that we are recording the meeting and we're going to generate a transcript so that we'll be able to share the conversation with folks who are unable to join us tonight so keep that in mind. Um, and there's another bit of housekeeping here. Stephanie will embed the stream text caption in the chat box tonight. Although the captions should also be embedded. I have to admit, I don't know what that means. So I'm gonna ask Steph to explain what that means right now. Yeah, um, you can either click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen to view the captions, or you can access the stream text link that I'm, I put in the chat box. Um, and one of the good things about stream text is it allows you to change the font size and the font color. And you can access it on a separate device, or you can do a split screen by clicking on the link, and then you go to your upper right hand corner of your box and you click on the little boxes next to the X and that way the stream text won't take up the whole screen and you can also view the Zoom meeting. So you have two, a couple of different options there. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I, I see in the chat and so, you know, I guess I do see the chat from time to time. Um, yeah, and, and Karen, Karen said, the house has just adjourned. Okay, so I think very shortly, um, our other legislators uh, may be joining us. I hope so. I kind of think that um, it's, I have to admit, I keep forgetting that we're all working at this um, 
remotely. And I keep thinking, oh yeah, it's gonna take them a while to get from the floor back to their committee rooms or to their to offices. And I, I sort of forget that they're, uh, um, they're flipping from one Zoom link to another or uh, whatever kind of link they use um, when, they're, when they're in session. So we've invited four legislators with us uh, to be with us who have personal experience with disability. And I'm gonna leave it to them to say as little or as much about the specifics of that but I am, but as I turn the meeting over to the panelists, I would suggest that it would be good to think about a few things generally um, as you lead into speaking about your perspectives on legislation. Um, and one is, has the per experience of disability been a motivating factor in the issues you choose to focus on? Has your personal experience affected or changed the way you approach a particular issue? And what would you like your legislative peers to think about when they consider legislation that affects people with disabilities? Um, I don't want our panelists to feel uh, pinned in by, by those kinds of uh, perspectives. If that's what you'd like to talk about, that's great. But I'd like each person to take at least about um, five or no, about eight minutes, I think, was is good. And I see on my screen that John Kalaki just joined us, Representative Kalaki. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Senator Polina has been with us. And I can't see that our other two guests have been here yet, but um, uh, maybe Safakor, you could let me know um, as folks come in or step. The floor is just finishing our work right now. We're just about to recess. So I jumped out a little bit early. Okay, perfect. I appreciate that, John. Um, we hope that afterward, so please, you know, share your thoughts on current issues um, and, and think of the suggestions I made as, as just ideas or an outline. Um, we really want to hear what's on your mind as you work your way into the second part of the legislative session. Um, which I guess, judging by the floor action, you are well into. Um, we hope that afterwards we've got some time to have you field questions. Um, some have been submitted in advance by uh, some of the folks you see on the screen. Um, and others, you know, folks will be putting things into the chat box, I'm sure, as we go along. Um, so, we're really pleased to have you folks with us. Uh, and I'm speaking to the panelists. Um, we understand that things get rolling, things are extremely busy, um, schedules get hectic, and there's a lot of pressure on people. And personally, you know, having had the experience of serving in the legislature myself, um, I can't imagine how much more difficult your jobs are currently working with the issues, not only that a pandemic brings up, but not having the um, ability to work face-to-face -face in the environment of the state house, which, you know, it's, it's a tremendously, um, it's a wonderful environment to work in, in my experience. And, uh, you know, I thank you for, for uh, tackling things in the way that you do. Um, folks witnessing this, if I gave a proper introduction to each of our panelists, we would not have time for anything else uh, because we have four people who have really um, done a lot, um, not just in their legislative careers, but in the rest of their careers to, to further human rights uh, in our society. Um, John Kalaki, representative, brings years of experience in the arts and in making them accessible to all. And he's now making a reputation for himself as a strong advocate for human rights, for people with disabilities, LGBTQ community, the BIPOC communities, and frankly, for all Vermonters. And we thank you, John, for being here. Um, I guess I'll wait to say a word or two about uh, representatives Donahue and, uh, and coach Christie, um, but Senator Polina has made a career out of service 
making a huge difference in our agriculture community over years. And as a legislator, he's been our champion in the disabilities community on issues ranging from respectful language in the Vermont statutes to service for our deaf peers and beyond. Um, I thank you all for your service. And if you're ready to begin, I was going to turn it over to John first um, and, and we'll give you about, uh, you know, roughly eight minutes, John, if that's okay. And uh, would be happy to hear from you uh, and let us know what's on your mind. And then when we're all done, we'll let you know what's on our minds. Well, thank you. And uh, what a blessing to be with all of you today. And thank you for your work. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring sort of uh, all parts of myself to the conversation. And 25 years ago, uh, I had surgery uh, for a tumor inside my spinal cord that was unexpected. And um, the surgery did not go as uh, hoped. And I woke, I woke up quadriplegic uh, from the surgery. And it took me about three months to learn how to walk again. So in midlife, I, was, I, I left a temporarily abled world. And I was in an amazing state of shock at how invisible I was, how people projected their own fears on me, how they avoided me, um, even though I you know, had certain kind of agency in the world. I was working at the Walker Art Center at the time. Um, and so I began to kind of w understand a whole different side of something that I had no uh, relationship to. Uh, Sadly, I would say. Um, as my artist self, I, I also am a practicing artist. Um, I found that there wasn't a lot of artistic representation other than what we all in this room know is inspiration porn. That is, oh, look at those nice people with disabilities. Isn't that sweet that they're trying to dance? Or look at, they're trying to make a painting. And artists weren't being taken seriously. So, um, I did a couple of things. I, I gathered a book called Queer Crips, Disabled Gay Men and Their Stories. And it was turned down by every disability press because it said it wasn't inspirational. It was about people's real lives and people dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts, overcoming a lot of ad, um, adversary in their lives, um, people being sexy. They don't think people with, with disabilities have sex. Um, the gay press has also turned it down because they said it wasn't buff boys and lipstick dykes. So it was an interesting thing about, well, who is this for? And I realized, well, it's, it's for people like me who didn't have any other reference points in the world. And the book was published. It won a Lambda Literary Award. It's now in curriculum and queer studies in many universities because there wasn't one at that point like that. Um, so I, I, I learned that it was really important that we find voice uh, in our world and, we, and we, we really push it out into the world. Um, another thing I did as an artist is I was working a lot with uh, mixed ability dancers, which meant they were dancers with and without disabilities. And uh, my friends were making a film or they were making a, a stage piece. And I said, could I come and film them? And I said, but what I wanna do is I don't want to film you with your apparatus. And everyone was, everyone was going to be nude in the, in the performance piece they were working on. But I said, can I come film? And they said, yes, I wrote this voiceover. It's called Dream and Awake. And I said, because what happens is we're defined by our apparatus. If you roll in a, in a, into a room in a chair, people see the chair first, or they see our walker or they see our cane or something. So I actually made a, a, a film that has, uh, people are beautifully nude and, but there's none of the chairs, none of the canes were there. And so many people said to me afterwards, but there aren't people with disabilities in that film. And it was like, well, isn't that interesting that, you know, what we saw were people carrying each other, lifting each other, leaning into each other, falling, being picked up in very different ways of fully abled bodies. And so it became an interesting thing about what is our disability to the world? Um, the third piece is I, I did a piece called Holding On, which is about partners of those of us in midlife that get disabled because 
society projects it all on, on me, that it was my issue. But they forgot that I had a husband who was now living to dis with my disability as well. And um, when I asked at the rehab hospital, well, is there anyone, and is there a, a group that my husband would go to? They said, for what? And I said, well, he's living with disability now too. And so anyway, holding on, it's on Vermont public uh, television has shown it. You can, you can see it there. It's uh, three couples talking about dealing with disability. Because in all of this, I thought it was important to talk about the realness of it, not the projection of it and not the inspiration porn of disability. Um, and then I've been an arts administrator at the Flynn Center. Um, I moved here in 2010 to, to run that theater. And what I was finding in my industry is that um, architectural accommodation is pretty much where people stopped in the arts. And they thought that was giving us access. And it's not, um, you know, because as we looked at, um, we did ASL work, if people requested it in our community, but what we said to our artists, we'd like to do some audio description work as well. Choreographers have said, well, why would you want to do that? And it's like, well, it's not for you, it's for the audiences who want to come. But the artists weren't used to this kind of conversation about, well, no, it's for everybody. We also started doing sensory friendly programming for initially we thought it was for kids, uh, family with kids on the spectrum. But what we found when we did this, it wasn't so hard. You didn't ask anyone to change any of the script. We just lifted the lights up a little bit. You were allowed people to walk around and the ushers didn't tell people to shush or go sit down and stuff. And suddenly family matinees were a lot more fun for everybody. So any kind of, of these accommodations we were doing, it made it easier for everybody. So as I came into the legislature, I thought, okay, well, you know, we'll see how far we are. And our building is not even, that deals with no accommodation whatsoever. And there is no accommodation for any difference uh, on the, the house floor. Even um, I see Representative Burroughs is here with me and yeah, I was new last year, she's new this year. The tradition is that as a new member, you get to pick your seat after everyone who's already seated gets to pick their seat and whatever is left. So I had to go to the Speaker of the House and say, well, that's actually not gonna work. And she said, why? And I said, well, I walk with a cane and I actually need an aisle seat. And so, but the tradition hadn't been questioned before that, you know, or if someone needs some kind of assisting visual or audio assistant, it's like, well, no, the tradition is the tenured people get to sit in wherever they want and everyone else gets what's left. And so that changed. Uh, Representative Burroughs did not have to um, argue for her seat <laughs> this year, which was nice, but, um, and uh, I see Karen there and a few, a few of my other friends from um, our community and, Last year, during Disability Awareness Day, we had, uh, there were a number of us in chairs and um, the Secretary um, of Arms said to me, well, you know, pe the people in chairs are gonna have to be outside. I said, what do you mean outside? The house chamber. And I said, no, they can't be. This is Disability Awareness Day. And they said, well, they can't be in the aisles. They're gonna block access. I said, are you telling me we've invited people to the people's house on Disability Awareness Day, and we're telling people with chairs that they have to sit outside at the back of the bus and listen to how we are welcomed into the community. And so clearly it wasn't intentional. It was just, it was like, oh no, well, wait a minute. No, we, we can have people be in the aisle. It's, it's, it's not a problem. And of course it's not a problem. But I, I find that this kind of bringing ourselves fully forward is an interesting issue. Um, in the state house, it's not different than in the theaters. It's not different than my own artwork, and it's it's things that all of you bring forward really in your work, in your lives, and the lived experience that you bring in really do change things. And so, I need all of you to keep kicking my butt on these issues, uh, encouraging us forward, and not not accepting things in a quiet way that are inappropriate. You know, and it's, um, we have a long way to go. 
represent Tango and I, I see she's, she's with us today. In our committee, we're looking at the eugenics apology of the bill in 1931. And as you know, that targeted a lot of people with disabilities. And people were, you know, separated from their families, they were institutionalized, people were sterilized. The, the legacy of eugenics in the, in the impact in the disability community is profound. It continues today. And so it's something that we're really all learning to talk about um, together, about these issues and learn together. So, but we can't do that without all of you. So I'm grateful to be here with all of you. And uh, I'm eager to hear from my other colleagues and then talk about any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, it's, it's not just a pleasure, but it's an, an honor. It's an honor to have you with us. Um, and now I'm gonna uh, turn, the, uh, turn the mic, I should say, well, it's not really a microphone, but uh, turn things over uh, to Senator Polina. Um, and uh, um, I see also, I think that Representative Donahue has, has joined us. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're taking turns in and we're, uh, and we're going along for about eight minutes each um, uh, to give some perspective on, uh, um, on things. So, Anthony, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Never. Well, first, I really appreciate having this opportunity, and I really enjoyed listening to John tell his story, to tell you the truth. I mean, it was a joy to, to listen to, and I think it's really, I really appreciate what he's been through and how he's continued to move forward with his art and his advocacy. It was really great, inspiring. Um, my story is Definitely. Well, it's different. I think, I think I've think i never actually had a conversation like this with people before, to tell you the truth. I mean, my disability just became upon my, started to affect me about the same time I got elected to the state Senate. It actually happened two years earlier when I was running for governor and I was out meeting a lot of people and I started to feel shaky all the time. And I realized that something was wrong. So my disability for what it's called is related to Parkinson's. And I really get, I get shaky. I get um, I have trouble walking. I have trouble with balance, and it's it's it it it's not fun. I mean, it's I don't know whether it's changed my priorities as a legislator or not, but I think it's changed. It's made me feel. It's made me. I, I've always been impatient about policy changes and about realizing that change takes time, but it's made me more impatient with the pace of change that goes on around here or does not go on around here. And it's made me think that you know, life is much more vulnerable than I, I used to, I feel much more vulnerable than I used to. And I just feel like um, as someone who is a, had been a leader in terms of being organized, community organizer and used to standing in front of crowds and talking to people and being, you know, being able to mobilize people to now feeling more self-conscious about playing that role. Because it's like, if I have to go in front of a room of people, what if I start to shake? What if I start to like lose my balance? What if I can't can't formulate my thoughts the way I'd like to, whatever it might be. It just makes me feel much more vulnerable and much more sort of unsure of where I'm at. Um, and legislators, of course, policymakers are also confident, right? I mean, that's what it's all about, is about being confident, being loud, being strong, being clear. And it's been more difficult for me to do that in the last couple of years. I mean, I still do the best I can, obviously, but it's been it's been more of a challenge. And I think more and more what it's made me think is how important it is that other people's voices are heard in these policy debates that we have. And I always tell people that probably the most inspiring speech I've ever heard in the state house was a speech made by a boy named Troy Daniels a long time ago. It seems like a long time ago. And the thing about Troy, he had multiple dis developmental disabilities, but he couldn't speak. He, well, he still can't speak. He used that electronic device to be heard. And he stood up in front of a room full of people in, in the state house and told his story about how changes to policy were gonna basically budget cuts and programs that were important to him. were gonna make his already challenging life that much more challenging. And he said it in such an inspirational way that it really struck me strongly. And I've never forgotten listening to what he had to say. At the time I was beginning to work with a group of people who were parents of kids with disabilities who came up to me one day in the coffee shop and basically said, you know, we're having these issues with budget cuts. Could you help us? Could you work with us? And I didn't really know much about the issue, but tell you the truth at the time. 
But I learned a lot from these mothers, particularly mothers and kids. When we got together and spent time talking with each other, and they, they really inspired me a lot to want to continue to work with them on those issues. And um, it's it's made me feel that it's more important than ever that people who have to people who are it's it's hard to sort of speak up and come forward if no matter who you are but it's particularly hard for those people who are struggling with disabilities at the same time and i think it's that much more important that they make sure their voices are heard and there have been so many times when we've squeezed people into committee rooms in the state house and i always got the feeling i always get the feeling i, I shouldn't generalize like that but i get the feeling often that legislators bless their hearts they don't really want to hear from people very often tell you that's truth they'd rather just do their business and come up with their proposals and talk amongst themselves but the last thing they want sometimes is to have a bunch of people in chairs or with canes or with other disabilities coming into their room to crowd them in and speak their minds i think it's really important that people continue to do that um you know for me it's also interesting because like I'll be in a meeting with people and we'll be doing what we need to do. And in the meantime, I'm thinking about how am I going to get through, how am I going to get out of this room when we're done talking, when we're done with this meeting? I mean, am I going to be able to get up and walk across this room? Am I going to be able to get through that doorway the way I would like to get through that doorway? Or am I going to look sort of like I'm not, I have diminished capabilities, which sort of undermines my ability to provide leadership in the legislature. These are pers perspectives. I'm not saying it's, I don't know whether what I just said is true or not, but it's just with the feeling I get and what makes me wonder about how people view you as a legislator, as a policymaker, as a leader, when you have diminished capabilities to get to move around in certain kinds of ways. So I just think that, um, legislators need to have more empathy when they talk with people. I don't think they need to have pity, that's for sure, because people with disabilities are some of the most inspiring people I've ever met. And they, they know, nobody knows better what's going on for you than you do yourself. And it's important that you don't let other people speak for you, but you speak for yourself as, as, as always. And I think that legislators have to be willing to like take take people for what they are and realize that so for some people it's been hard just to get to the state house as john mentioned it's hard just to get to a meeting it's hard to like go to and be part of an organization but it's the, the legislators need to realize that that's that's hard enough but to make the extra effort to come down and like engage when you have a disability is something that people should be rewarded for and recognized for and respected for i think it's really important and so you know I just, I feel like um, people need to have the courage to realize that they're different. Doesn't mean they're, doesn't mean they're diminished. It means that they're different and they are as good or better than everybody else in the room. So I, I don't know. I just think that it's important that we respect all of, all of, we respect everyone for what they are and look at the ability within their disability. And I think that legislators are coming around to that, but it's been hard. I mean, people don't want to spend money in the legislature very often. It's difficult to like find support for needed programs. We've struggled really hard to make sure that programs for people with disabilities were family-centered, family-friendly programs and funded in a way that kept families together. So that, that's, and that's something that I think legislators don't necessarily think about unless you really make the point to them very strongly. So I, I, I just think that people need to understand that People with disabilities are very common. There are many of us uh, have disabilities of various kinds. And it's important that we respect everybody for what they are and what they can be. So I'll just leave it at that. I look forward to answering questions rather than ramble on about what my own perspective is. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. And, and I really shouldn't do this, but I'm gonna interject one little comment that, that uh, I has to say, your, what you've said really resonates with me. Having been a legislator, uh, you know, I served for six terms, but I'll tell you in the first term or two, uh, I, I felt so often that people patronized me. And it wasn't until they realized that I was damn well going to exert that one, the power of that one vote that I had, that they really got off that and stopped looking at the wheels. And instead, looked yeah. at who I was. Um, it, it was it was quite a challenge um, back in the day, you know. I and I I hope things have changed for the better since then. Um, yeah, they probably have somewhat, but they still have a ways to go. Believe me. 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn this over now. I see that uh, we've been joined by uh, Coach Christie, and uh, I hope he doesn't mind coming on next. And, um, you know, I also hope Coach doesn't mind me using his, his nickname, Coach, because he's the kind of guy that makes you feel comfortable as though you're old friends the first time you meet him. Uh, and has been my experience. And uh, uh, he's been a long-term ally. He's served the community on many levels. He's protected our rights on the Human Rights Commission. And in the legislature, he has been a pillar of rights for all of us. Uh, and, and so rather than me going on, Coach, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. We've been taking about uh, about eight minutes each to uh, uh, for for the legislative panelists, and then we're going to do uh, uh, questions and discussion afterwards. So thank you very much for being here, and I'm going to make myself mute. Hey Ed, thank you very much, my friend. Uh, we go back a long ways. Um, I'd like to. Uh, uh, thank everybody for being here and for your time. And it's great to hear from my friend Anthony and my friend John and looking forward to hearing from Sister Anne. And, you know, life, you know, is, is you know, it's a journey. Um, you know, I, I remember when I got here, you know, I was, you know, you know, the young, you know, takeover kind of guy and all of this stuff. I was 23 when I got to Vermont. And so things started to change though, you know, o over time, you know, I think, you know, that old expression, you know, you, uh, if you knew how long you were going to be on the planet, you would have treated your body better. <laughs> well, uh, the years of uh, uh, doing sports and, you know, just, you know, normal work uh, started to ravage my knees. You know, those were the things that started to fail, you know, first. Uh, and, and that's where my, my personal sensitivity to um, dealing with, with a physical difference, let alone the social uh, and racial differences. Uh, became very, very apparent. Um, uh, it was, um, I was serving on the uh, Governor's Rehab Advisory Council, uh, and uh, this was in the, in the 90s. And it, I, I really started, you know, it was bone on bone. You know, I knew at some point I'd have to, you know, get... Uh, some mechanical devices implanted in order to just function. Uh, but I kind of waited as long as I could. But during that time, you know, mobility was an issue. Um, and, you know, it, it became apparent to me uh, as well during that time, how insensitive, you know, some of our fellow uh, uh, human beings can be about understanding that a handicapped parking space is that. And when you see somebody park there and then jump out of the car and go inside and you call them on it, oh, I was only there for a minute, you know, we're, you know and, and you get into that. Uh, you know, it becomes really um, clear, you know, how, um, uh, you know, inhumane some folks can be and insensitive, you know, to um, those of us that uh, actually need that space. You know, there, there's times even to this day where e even though I, I use a walking stick or a cane, I go, do I need to use this space? If there's only one, you know, I, I might park one space over in case somebody else really needs that space, you know? And, you know, I, I it, it's, 
it's a study in human nature. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's something that we continually work around and on all the time it is um, trying to change the hearts and minds and in everybody's hearts and mind is capable of that but it's in its own time and place you know so um, one of the things that I think we've all come to find out is you know, those folks that have been doing, you know, this advocacy work over the time, persistence, you know, I, I think that's one of the key uh, values that, uh, you know, we bring, you know, to this work. Um, never say never. <laughs> um, it was just like when I decided to run for the, the legislature, it took three times, you know, um, and so you figure that's six years, you know, uh, to, to get to this, you know, this point. Uh, but that persistence, you know, I know just from, you know, family and, you know, some very good mentorship over the years that, you know, that will get you to... Uh, the point that you'd like to get to, which is usually self-actualization. But first you have to feel safe, you know, and I think that's one of the, the important things that we as legislators need to do for people who are coming to the people's house. And it doesn't matter if it's the virtual people's house or if it's the physical people's house people, that means all people, need to feel safe. And if they feel safe in that environment, the potential for doing good work is even more stronger. And, and I see Ed, Ed nodding and, and, and Anthony's going, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, you, because it goes back to the witnesses that Anthony was talking about. You know, the, the reason he was able to feel strong was because of you. You made him feel safe. You know, and he knew that and he could re rely on that. You know, that's our job, you know, as as legislators, you know, to make that happen so that when we ask for your voice, you will feel comfortable enough to share your experience and your strength and your hope with us so that we can do your work because that's, that's the mission. You know, that's the mission. And, you know, I'm really honored and humbled to be able to, to do this work. Um, you know, it, it's a gift. Um, and even though there are days that, um, you know, you get, uh, <laughs> you question that, um, it still raises to that level. We had a meeting this morning and getting close to my eight minutes and you know, I set a timer just so I kind of knew. <laughs> um, we had a meeting this morning of the Social Equity Caucus and it was one of the coolest meetings we've had in a, in a long time because you know we we got into a heart to heart discussion you know around um, around you know just you know just human beings you know in human being being human <laughs> you know you know not about black white you know brown but human being you know that's what this is about you know and in, in any of our protected classes it still goes back to human being and if we can do that anything's possible so I'll, 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 I'll leave us with, uh, with that. And I really am uh, honored to be here with you all. And most of you I know. So uh, 
it's great to see you and looking forward to uh, Q and A. Coach, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And, you know, I, I, again, I will make one small comment. And, you know, when you mention safety as such an issue on the part of the, it's for everyone and it's for the exchange of ideas and it's for the civil exchange of ideas. I, I, you know, I remember times when certain uh, controversial issues came up that I'm sure you remember and others of you remember, um, there was sometimes such a tense atmosphere in the state house that, that we got away from that feeling that it was an open place for everyone. Um, and, and it just, that's uh, the feeling of comfort, safety, and respect for human beings and being human is, is so crucial. So now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Representative Donahue. Um, and you know, she's been outspoken for parity in, uh, in mental health issues. And she's been a consistent voice for the civil rights of people with um, uh, psychiatric disabilities and um, a real active um, person. And, and you know, I'm, long before she was a member of the legislature, she was drawn into it um, from a sense of civic duty and from a sense of the experience, uh, experiences that life had, had handed her way. And so, you know, with, with a lot of appreciation uh, and, and respect, and I'm gonna turn it over to you and mute myself again. Thank you, Ed, and uh, um, thank you for the intro. Um, I would say, uh, unfortunately, civic duty probably wasn't uh, the biggest uh, motivator because I can go back and say, you know, the first half of my life, um, I had no interest uh, either in the political process or in the issue of mental illness. Um, I, I wanted to be an advocate for children. That was my whole focus. And um, I can think back and, you know, one of the reasons I went to Georgetown for law school is they had such a great clinical program. I wanted to be involved in the clinics and they had three primary clinics, juvenile justice, criminal law, and mental health law. And it was like, <laughs> mental health law, you gotta be kidding. I wouldn't go near those people. <laughs> wouldn't want to be involved in that. Um, and, uh, you know, that probably was, uh, pretty much an attitude I kept that I think a lot of people have that uh, stayed with me until, until it happened to me. Um, and I'll never forget the day, um, my first admission to a hospital and thinking, how can it be? How can my life have come to this, that I'm a patient in a psychiatric hospital, psychiatric wing? Um, and the sense of, uh, of failure of, um, you know, what, what that meant to not just be labeled, but to self-label. Um, but the other thing I experienced um, pretty rapidly was the, the discrimination that existed on a more practical level in terms of uh, healthcare coverage, insurance, you know, I had the wrong kind of illness and I always had maintained insurance coverage, but um, discovered that uh, I didn't have the same coverage for uh, psychiatric hospitalization and care. And, and so that was what pushed me in the direction of, of starting to speak, um, really terrified coming the first time at a, at a public hearing at the state house uh, when the uh, legislature was discussing uh, the parity law back in the in the late 90s um, and you know that that really led me to a passion for the whole topic of health care and health care access which really became my focus um, and and really has stayed my focus in in getting involved in the legislature but health care recognized as meaning and including mind body spirit um, all of what we are and who we are being part of health. Um, and that, you know, that's an ongoing battle. That's, that's uh, nothing that we've achieved yet um, to um, look at it in the same way, to provide equivalent 
uh, budgeting, to uh, do any of those things. We're um, battling constantly with caps and limitations on what the community mental health system uh, is appropriated, for example, when other parts of the system um, aren't held to that kind of, of caps or restrictions. You know, they get what it what they say is needed to keep keep running in other pieces of the system. Um, so uh, that that it's an ongoing um, battle. But when I think about being in the legislature and when I decided to run, there were a couple of pieces I think that are of, of maybe interest. First of all is is when I started going door to door campaigning, um, I had been involved in a very public media public battle with what was then Fletcher Allen Healthcare. So um, it was part of when I was approached and encouraged to run, a piece of it was thinking, well, if I'm ever gonna do something like that, now's the time because I have some, some name recognition. But that also meant that was attached to being a uh, you know, psychiatric survivor, to having being a person with that experience. And what I found going to door to door is when people knew I had that background, it was all of a sudden a whole different thing because they wanted to tell me about their spouse or their child or themselves and share those same struggles um, because they knew they had a safe person uh, to talk to. Um, but for, for many years in the legislature and, and you know, it's recovery is a slow ongoing progress. And so for many years after I was uh, first elected um, you know, it kept being a, a struggle. And part of the struggle is it might be okay for other people to show that they're vulnerable sometimes. It might be okay for other people uh, to be upset because they were really working for something and it, and it didn't happen. Um, but it was not okay for me because I knew if I showed that kind of same vulnerability, it would get labeled right away. Oh, she must be having a late relapse. Oh, it must be her mental illness. So I couldn't have that. And, uh, you know, thank goodness for some places like, you know, I, there was one day that things were so bad, my just reaction to things going on. I went, I went over to another way in the middle of the legislative day so that I had a place I could just cry and, you know, be, be with peers supporting me and uh, having a place where it was okay. Um, but, um, I have to say, um, I really think that as much as there is discrimination on so many levels, with so many different, uh, you know, disenfranchised minority groups, uh, including all types of disabilities, I really do think that psychiatric disability is kind of the last disenfranchised uh, group where it's still socially acceptable to discriminate. Because after all, you know, they are different, you know. I mean, they're scary, they have mental illness, they're, you know, all these different things. So we still, I still hear it in legislative committee meetings. I still, still those conversations. And I, to me, you know, kind of the clearest articulation of that was uh, the last four years of uh, who the president was and he said all sorts of awful things about all sorts of groups. But when he said them, he was critiqued. The media was all over him. It was outrage. Except when he talked about people who were psychos. You didn't get that same outrage. You didn't get that media reaction. Because that's still, that's still different and that's still socially acceptable. So, so I guess like the other folks, uh, you know, um, great to have some, it'll be great to have some time for question and conversation, but that's sort of um, what I wanted to share. Anne, thank you very much. And, you know, I, all four of you have, have, come into this with such a, a willingness to share this on a personal level. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, format 
it's not always too conducive to being personal about things, um, but you've made really made it work, and and I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, so, um, so we'll we'll move on. I I do want to note that uh, there's a couple of other legislators who have joined us, and um, I think. Uh, Representative Hangel, I leave. I, I know yours because you've got the rep labeled, and I think uh, Representative Burroughs is also here. And are there others that I've missed? And I want to thank you, folks, for joining us. Representative Small, thank you. Um, and we hope that the kinds of conversations that we have influence you all. <laughs> um, and because, frankly what these four folks have shared as our peers, as well as our uh, legislators, um, certainly I think uh, has influenced us. So I'm gonna move us to the next section. Um, it's, it's really, it's later than I thought because you know, the house had let out, had let out so, so late and all that. Um, and I don't know what kinds of time constraints people are on. So what I'd like to do is make this, oops, I've just got a note that Commissioner White is here with us too, um, as far as folks that uh, in official positions. And I thank you very much for taking the time to join us. What I'm gonna do, I think, um, what I'd like to do is if the four panelists would leave your selves unmuted, I'm gonna read the questions and if each of you, I'm not going to say, you know, each of you answer each one, but why doesn't whoever feels um, that you have an answer for a question, if you could jump in uh, and then, and we'll try to move through the questions pretty quickly because I don't know the time constraints that people are under. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to start by reading the ones that were submitted in writing beforehand. Um, and we have from Rebecca Chalmers of Rockingham, when will the legislature disallow the targeted exclusion of my group's defining healthcare need? Um, and for folks who don't know Rebecca, um, she's hard of hearing and has been advocating for uh, insurance to cover hearing aids um, throughout. And she notes that all other New England states have at least some degree of coverage. Um, and uh, she, she pointedly asks, when are we important enough for you to act? So I, I think I have to take that on because I'm on the healthcare committee and that issue has been brought to us specifically this year. Um, and we actually had it on our list as something to try to uh, at least get some testimony and try to start addressing. Um, uh, and, and I know it's going to sound like excuses, but, but COVID is an excuse. The Zoom process uh, makes it much more difficult to take action and, and move things along. We've been limited in our, in our subjects and we get things that get put on our plate that we don't have a choice about addressing. So um, we did not, I will say right up front, we did not address it you know, it's past crossover, it won't happen this year. But there's also a, a big, challenging, complicated situation. And I think we are going to be asking the Department of Financial Regulation to bring us more information about how are other states doing things and what are they doing. But that is federal law and its control. When it comes to the um, any kind of insurance on the healthcare exchange, um, Anything that we add that is not considered part of the essential benefits package, the state has to pay 100%. The federal government won't contribute any uh, you know, matching amounts and, and so forth. It's outside of the package. And a huge percentage of the insurance in Vermont in the private market is under self-insured companies, everything but basically the small employers on the exchange. And we cannot impose any requirements on them. It's controlled by federal law if they're under ERISA. So it's not an easy topic. That's not a good excuse for not trying to spend some time. And I think it, it, is, it is on our agenda to want to, and we did not 
we did not get to it this year and, and I can't make any further excuses about it. That's the reality. But I, I'm holding my hearing aids. I cannot agree more that we need to do something about this. So I'll be bringing it up again next next year with all of us. There's there's a lot of support in, in the, the house for this. Well, and our chair has a constituent who is very, very articulate and pushing yes. him on it, which is one of the reasons that he really wanted it as a priority this year. So um, I know he regretted it as well. Thank, thank you both. Um, the next question is from uh, Sharon Medina of Barry, and she points out that there is a lack of supportive living opportunities in her son's community for when she dies and when there are no family members that can provide for him. Her son is a, an individual who, who I think I know pretty well, um, who has uh, developmental disabilities. Um, so I'll leave that question out for anyone who wants to think about that. Somebody else has to take a turn here. <laughs> unless, unless we want to let Commissioner White say a word on that. Finding the unmute button. So, um, to some extent, I, I was not prepared to speak to that particular question. And being a third day on the on the job, um, we absolutely do recognize the importance of um, having adequate home and community based supports, um, particularly in situations where family caregivers are no longer um, able to um, able to provide that that caregiving role and. Um, beyond that, in terms of systemic stuff, I'm not really prepared at this point to speak to that other than to note that it's a very real reality for many Vermonters um, facing that type of situation and the uncertainty of, you know, what happens with their, the care for their loved one um, in the event that they're no longer able to do it themselves. And so it's um, a priority to make sure that we do have wraparound supports available to uh, make sure that that is su as successful as it can be. Um, regrettably, I don't have specifics beyond that, but other than assuring that it is a Dale priority and well on our radar screen. Well, I apologize for putting you on the spot. That, I should be fired as a moderator. Um, but no, that's quite all right. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm just thinking back to last year's um, Disability Awareness Day event that unfortunately got canceled being, you know, the first week things were shutting down. So um, it's nice to be able to have this opportunity um, in lieu of the actual in person. Um, and I'm really grateful to um, the folks, uh, the legislators who shared their um, very compelling personal experiences and to the folks that are here. So thank you. Thank you. And did you want to say a word on that? No, I was saying I, I didn't want to dominate responses. So I was saying somebody else should take it. I mean, I was on the Human Services Committee for years. So I'm certainly, uh, you know, aware, very much aware of the issue, but I, I'm not in the best position to react. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Ed, Ed, in, in sure. uh, Representative Hangos and my, we sit on general housing and military affairs and in, in getting testimony about the eugenics resolution, we did hear from a woman that was, had been in Brandon. And it was profoundly moving to hear her lived experience of that. So it's very clear to us that that can never happen again in our state. That, and so I think the, the issue is a very important one, as you say, with parents who take care of their adult uh, children and what's going to happen in the next generation but you know we, we still are still learning the lessons of that chapter in Vermont's history of, of how to house people so um, it's not a response to the dilemma at hand but it is a response that let's learn from our history to make sure that never happens again. Thank you thank you John. Um, I'm well, gonna... Ed, Ed uh, oh, are ahead. we still on that question? We can be. Um, you know what it what it makes me you know think about uh, is uh, sometimes we limit 
uh, ourselves to perfect. And I think everybody in this room knows taint nothing perfect. Sometimes we just need to act with our hearts in the right direction and look at best practices and say, if we had that control, what might we do with it? Because that's how we get things done. If you look at any innovation, any change over the human time, it's been in response to a problem or a question. So, you know, it's that approach. You know, I, I like to call it, it you know, it, it's almost like uh, Disney uh, has Imagineering. That's what we need to be as Imagineers. You know, and, and that's how we'll get some of these problems, you know, uh, at least addressed, not perfectly, but at least addressed. But we have to keep approaching it that way. Just a thought. Well, I'll tell you, it's um, when you think about how much better we do than we did when we institutionalized people, a lot of imagination went into those changes and we, as the generations move on, we, we need to keep applying imaginations, uh, imagination to our challenges. Well, Ed, I, I, I mean, I, I just have to add to that, you know, I mean, we like to think that way, but, you know, we, in some ways we, we are in the midst of backsliding because as we speak, you know, over the past 10 years, we've almost doubled the use of inpatient hospitalization for people with a psychiatric uh, disability where community supports has remained stagnant. So that's telling us something about going in the wrong direction in yeah. terms of uh, the more institutional and coercive kinds of care. Absolutely. It's also, telling us, it's also telling us that we made a commitment that everybody would be able to live in their communities safely and, and independently. And it was a nice, it was a great commitment to make, but we haven't followed through on that commitment. And I think part of it is not being willing to make the investment that it takes to make it happen. Yeah. And then we end up spending a lot more on the you know, institutional higher Emergency levels of care, care yeah. uh, constructing new buildings, huge costs to run them, uh, repeating that all over again because we're starving the community system to support people in the community. Absolutely. So, uh, Anthony, I'm looking forward to the Senate pushing back on. Mm -hmm. I think we have some, some collaboration in the works going on, folks. Um, <laughs> But that's absolutely right. I, I've never been, um, you know, I was there when we closed, Brandon, and when we did a, a big step down, you know, from, from uh, I forget the exact numbers, but a big step down to, um, you know, to what was 54 beds at the state hospital before it flooded. And then we, um, you know, made commitments that in changing our involuntary medication rules, uh, laws, uh, that we would maintain a very small number of people who would be treated by force. And yet, I think we've pretty close to annually, we are about four times as often, we used force drugging, um, court ordered force drugging than we did um, when the current uh, statute was passed. But don't let me keep talking. I'm going to read uh, some more of the questions that were submitted. Um, Dan Towell of Montpelier um, asks, what are the many ways peer support services have helped those of us in the disability community? And in what ways can we expand and deepen the highly therapeutic and cost effective peer support services in Vermont? I think, you know, in many ways, it was like a slow recognition. It, it moved slowly. I think there's actually a much, much bigger and growing recognition of the value of peer support. Um, has the money followed that yet? Uh, no, 
or only in part, there are commitments being made. Um, you know, like after we build this new institution next year, we're going to invest in peer support. So we shall see. But, um, uh, you know, he's exactly right. All the evidence. I'll, I'll tell you a horribly sad story. Last year, listening to a conference committee between Senate and House Appropriations, and there was a some language the House had put in about prioritizing using peer workers. And there was a senator who said, oh, but we only want to use evidence-based programs. Oh, really? Oh, my God. They apparently don't know that peer support is officially recognized as evidence-based. Not that I'm picking on the Senate today. Well, well, well Ann, you Easy know. Easy pickings. <laughs> I, I, I like to refer to it as you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, it's not like trying to be some big brain or anything. Uh, but that's how I was taught, you know, to, to be um, uh, as, as open-minded as possible uh, because that's how you learn more. Um, and I, I think to get back to those other questions, they're, they're all embedded in our understanding, you know, and then to your point about commitment, you know, we can commit when we understand that it works, you know, it's best practice, right? You know, it, those of us that have done training, uh, any kind of mentoring, what do we do? We, we look at, wow, they did it that way and they got some really cool results. Well, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to do the thing that works. <laughs> you know, that's what it's really all, all about. And instead, that, that backsliding that, that Ann has mentioned is it's a default. Well, we did it that way 100 years ago and it seemed to be okay. So really, was it? that bad <laughs> you know oh wow but 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 anyways i i think a lot of it has to do with um uh just changing the paradigm you know um and you know we'll get you know we'll make progress again and you know you know what what's been the, the, this is only my second term so i'm a newbie in the legislature uh but the pandemic seemed to make us work differently across committees, across chambers. So in the housing, we were really focused on mitigating homelessness. We worked seamlessly with Representative Small's committee, Human Services. We worked together on coming up with solutions. In the Senate, we were working with Senator Sorok and on the housing issues because we had to move so quickly. We couldn't go back and forth and send something to the Committee of Jurisdiction to have them iterate it, then to send it to the Senate and have them iterate it mm -hmm. for the Senate to do the same. And I think we worked out really well. And so this year we began in the same way of, of how to work across these committees in a more holistic mm -hmm. way. So I, I think the same thing's gonna happen now with this enormous infusion of federal mm -hmm. dollars that we're gonna have to work differently um, and so I hope that these kind of conversations we're having just about the importance of, of you know, caregiving and stuff is, is embedded now in, in this new, and I hope this paradigm lasts for the legislature. I think it's a much right. more effective way to deal with mm -hmm. the, the communities here we're talking about, right. that it's, it's not health, human services, housing, you know, it's the whole person we're looking at, so. Thank you, that's, that's a point well taken. Um, Ed, there I'm are gonna, some questions coming in the chat. Would you like? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to just quickly finish the ones that were submitted in advance, oh, and then okay. we can move on to that. Okay, um, thank you. I I do, uh, and I also note that um, uh, I I think we had enlisted the assistance of our legislators from five to six, and so uh, let me know if if you have other commitments or just plain need to get off and, and absolutely no, uh, um, no offense will be taken. You folks have really given um, in, in this exchange. I'll, um, I'll, I'll hang in a little longer. I, I had a, uh, a St. Patrick's Day, you know, it's a Donahue thing. Oh, um, yes. Okay. I'm supposed <laughs> to be, be meeting someone. <laughs> that will be perfectly accepted. 
So I will go through, um, uh, and here Tracy Rue of Plainfield asks, accessing social benefits, mental health help, health access and information about services like Choices for Care are impaired by poor website design, inaccessible user interfaces, and a lack of plain, ang uh, plain language. Can this be legislatively addressed? Um, it can be, and it should be. There's, you know, we've had, we had, we've done an, an abysmal, dis, dismal record of how we do our IT work. So there's a lot of people who are dissatisfied, and we have a lot of systems that don't really work very well. Not just around healthcare, but around other other state age, state uh, programs as well. So we're really in the hole, like hundreds of millions of dollars practically, because we've never upgraded our systems. And so the, the, the questioner is absolutely correct. I mean, it's just, it's a serious problem that we're hoping that we're gonna be able to rectify a little bit with some of this federal money, but it's really not good that we're so far behind in our ability to like make things accessible over the web. It's really not good. And yeah, you know, we have the same thing that happens with similar problem with people who have, you, you are not English speakers, primary English speakers in terms of getting information that is available and translated into other languages as well. But it's really a problem. Our IT systems are really abysmal. Thanks well, to take that, to take oh. that, uh, you know, one, you know, step further is we think we know. Again, we don't know. You know, we have some of the best minds in this in the country, if not the world, in Vermont doing that kind of work and we're not even asking them to partner with us you know yeah. that is a problem that that is a problem you know i mean people are coming from all over the world to ask some of our vendors how to do exactly what we're having a problem doing and we don't take the time to talk to our next door neighbor who might be the most prolific you know proponent of that work you know so I, I i i'm pushing back a little bit just because you know we have the resources you know available we just haven't um asked people to come together and, and i'm not saying for free because you know at the same time you know their time is, is as valuable as anybody else's time and if we're asking for that help, we should, you know, remunerate for it as sure. well. That's the other the other thing. Because I'll bet you there's some folks on this call that have been doing IT for years and go, you know, look at my site. I got, I got a you know a formula for this or an algorithm that'll you know blow the doors right off of the problem. But anyways, that's that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Anthony. Appreciate. It. Hey, that's in the spirit of let's grow local, Coach. And yeah, no, I know the expertise is there. We just haven't made the commitment to bring those people on board and pay them to yeah. make it work. You got it. You got it, buddy. So I'm going to go to uh, a question from Dale Hackett of Barry. And I'm Dale's got some questions also in the chat. But I'm going to do the question he submitted in the advance, just in the spirit of doing things in order. And then in fairness, um, I'm going to next go to Jill Stevens, who I think had her hand up. So Dale asks, do you feel well informed about the topic of how the COVID variants will impact life, schools, community life going forward? And isn't such information key to creating good policy laws to be legislated? I add, this is Jill Stevens and I didn't have my hand up. I think I must have tapped on the wrong rubric there, sorry. Okay, no, no problem. So any thoughts on the question of uh, how the COVID variants might affect um, our different institutions in the state? And by institutions, I don't mean big buildings, but life, schools, community life going forward as, as Dale asks. Well, uh, Dale, if, if, if I might, start the conversation. Um, I think what's very daunting for me in the legislature is as we come out of COVID, 
what happens to all of our communities because we our federal dollars have been shoring up a number of things like um, there are 2,000 people who are living in hotels right now and 250 children are living in hotels they were uh, homeless before that and so every year Vermont did a annual point in time and mm -hmm. estimated there were about 1,100 people who were homeless in our state. Well, COVID comes and we had to move people out of congregate shelters, keep people safe. And now for almost a year, we've had 2,000 people living in hotels. That's been incredible. That has made a huge impact. But when these federal dollars leave us, what is Vermont now going to do with these 2,000 people, we we built out a number. Uh, you know, we, some of our federal dollars allowed us to build 250 new um, units. We we built we we had rental units as well, and there's another 150 or 200 of those. Uh, we've been able to upgrade our shelters, but once this period ends, there's going to be enormous amount of people moving back with no homes. And if we look at every sector and every committee's work. This is this is going to happen. This this, so as you say, COVID variants. I don't exactly know what that word means. I'm very worried about. Um, I think Vermonters and Vermont and the federal government stepped up in very profound ways, and and our governor did an administration did a great job leading us through this, but building our our civic lives, our social lives, our economic lives back out of this is going to take a very long time, and how we hold all of this sacred is, um, I, I wish I could see a path forward on that. And it's, it's very daunting to understand what to do. Yeah, I don't think uh, any of us understand what's going on, to be perfectly honest. And I think I that- Thank oh, I just wanted to thank Anne. She was on her way out. She had the previous commitment. Right. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Anthony. I was just gonna say, in terms of our institutions, it's I have no idea how we're gonna how we're gonna come out the other end of this. I mean, are schools ever gonna be the same again? Will business uh, workplaces be the same again? We really don't know. And I think everybody, you, know, you sit around the table. Well, you don't sit around the table these days. But when you talk to your people that you do talk to, everybody has a different idea about the vaccines and what's going on with the variant variants of the COVID and whatnot. But I think the one thing we all should know very well is that we don't have a clue as to what's really going on or how we're going to come out the other end of what's going on in terms of will college education ever be the same again? I mean, we're, we're teaching little kids to not hang out with other people. You know, I mean, little kids going to school with masks on or being isolated. I and mean, we have grandkids that are like are not hanging out with other kids for quite a while. It's just really it's really a lot of unknowns and it's kind of, it's kind of scary to be perfectly honest to how this how this is going to change how we work as a culture and a society and the community i mean we've got a lot of rebuilding to do and i think we'll come out okay but i think we'll we'll, we'll come out looking a little different than we went into it as well particularly around schools and workplaces yeah i think that's absolutely inevitable it it it's really i mean i see that with i see patterns that i think in my own workplace and, and among my staff who, who've had to adapt to working uh, remotely that um, I think there, it's inevitable that things are gonna be, um, are gonna go forward in some kind of a hybrid form. We're, we're not gonna yeah. be doing business exactly the same way as we did before. Um, in some ways that may be better, in some ways I, I think it may be worse. It's hard, it's hard to know and out of respect now for time, um, Dale had a couple of more questions in the chat that really, I think, Dale, if I'm being fair, boiled down to um, what are the ways in which we can pay for some of the mental health needs that were pointed to earlier? And I'm going to make that the last question from, from the audience, if that's okay with folks, uh, out of respect for these people's time. Well, I'm no expert, but I'd say we're going to come out of this with a lot more mental health problems than we went into it with, to be perfectly honest, caused by isolation and fear and whatnot and alienation. I think for sometimes for people with disabilities, particularly, who already can feel kind of isolated in their worlds, that this is going to create a more greater isolated feeling than they had before. And I think with young people as well, with you like mentioned the little kids, particularly, that man is growing up in a culture that's very different. So. I don't know how we're going to pay for it, quite honestly. I think we're going to have to make a serious commitment to making sure that we 
not only give mental health parity, but that we're willing to make real investments in mental health for for all you know, people of all ages. I think that we're going to look at some serious mental health problems arising from this COVID-19 pandemic. And we have to make it one of our top priorities to make sure that we make the investment necessary to make sure that people are made whole. Absolutely. And, um, and, oh, I yeah, might, go ahead, John. I might say, I said to my friend Karen Lafayette there last year, I said, you know, as a new legislator, the disability community is too quiet. You all got to get louder. And you all got to be present in more committees. And you have to really make sure that your community's voices and your lived experience is understood. Because as I think we've all testified, it's pretty invisible for most people. And yeah. with this upcoming time, this whole paradigm changing time, it's, it's more essential than ever that your voices are listened to. So I really encourage you to kind of, you know, Ed and Karen and a number of people, uh, you know, I, I know there's, there's three screens of people here. I, I'm only seeing a few, but it's, it's really essential that all of our committees are hearing from all of you. On, on a number of issues, you know, not just when it's a disability bill, because, you know, it, it's really, it, there's so much in all of this. So, um, you know, I, you should really connect with Coach or with Anthony or Elizabeth or Lisa, who's on here, or myself, Taylor, all of us. I mean, we're here um, for a reason. We're a part of this community. We want to work with you. And so, you know, check in with us about bills in our committees where we can tell you about stuff. And really it makes such a difference. You know, I'm an arts guy. I came into the legislature, I didn't know anything. So I, I'm learning every day from the lived experience and your voices have to be louder. John, we will accept that as a challenge. Okay. Um, I have one request. Um, Sefakor has a question to read. And if, if we could do that, then uh, then we'll wrap up. Yeah, so the question is, what words of wisdom do you have that might encourage folks with disability to serve in the legislature? Thank you. Mm. In terms of serving in the legislature, I was having come from a background of community organizing and I worked with a number of nonprofits before I served in the legislature did a lot of community-based work. And I frankly think that I was more effective and had a greater impact when I was as community organizer than I do in the legislature. So I guess I would just say that think twice about how to best spend your time and don't necessarily assume that the legislature is the place to garner the most power because there's a lot of power to be had in community building as well outside the legislature. So I, 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 I often think about whether this was the best way to have spent my time or not. I feel I was, for instance, I was a director of VPIRG for a while, an environmental consumer group. I worked with farmers. I started a group called Rural Vermont. I worked with families with disabilities as an organizer. And I think that, I often think that I was more effective then than I am. I'm sort of hamstrung in the legislature at some, sometimes. And I feel like I had more freedom to be a stronger advocate outside the legislature. I'm not saying people shouldn't try to be legislators if that's what they want to do. But don't presume that that's where the base of power really is because the power is in people meeting around their kitchen tables and church basements and coming together in the community to decide what's best for them and then making sure their voices are heard in the legislature. But the legislature is not necessarily the center of power. It's just where I, I, I go with the old adage that people lead, the leaders will follow. So think twice about how you where you want to spend your time. I, I sure hope you stayed there, <laughs> Anthony. You are a good voice for us to have in the legislature. Um, uh, Karen, you have your, your hand up. Go ahead. Then we're going to have to close soon. Spot. Yes, uh, to, to John's challenge. Um, we have been talking as an advocacy group how we can have more interaction and how we can tell our stories. Um, and one thing that COVID has done is <clears throat> it's kind of truncated the uh, uh, ability, the availability to be able to go into a committee and testify and tell your story. So I, I would love to work with, with any legislators who, who would want to talk about how we, how we can be more present in the state house, especially uh, uh, in, in light of, uh, of the, the remote um, access issues. Uh, if, if I can, uh, 
you know, I'm going to push back a little bit. And uh, to John's point about advocacy, one of the things that a lot of folks have come to understand in this COVID experience is I don't see it as an obstacle. I see it as an opportunity. We can get more of my people being you guys in front of committees now than we could before because of the hybrid communication capability. If you recall walking around the state house, you saw all the whiteboards and cameras and all of this equipment. We weren't even using it. For about eight years, that stuff sat there and nobody was using it. Every time that we sat down with a bill, we could have just as easily said, Karen, do you have two or three people that can sit down on Skype or do whatever? You remember coming into when I was on House General, you know, people would we'd call in people from Colorado and do all of this stuff. We can do that now. And I look at it as an opportunity. You know, it doesn't matter where the witness is, you know, as long as that witness is feeling safe and we create an environment where he or she can tell their story, you know, and, and that's where the rubber hits the road. You know, and we do have the technology and the ability to do that. You know, so I don't look at it as obstacles. I look at it as opportunities, you know, as we sit, you know, like right now. Uh, and and if we approach it that way, we can continue, you know, to to make some, you know, some steps. They're not always going to be strides, but they will be steps and hopefully in the right direction. Um, so. Uh, let's keep on moving forward. Well, thank you very much, Coach. And frankly, I don't see that as um, uh, as opposite to what John said, because yeah, I yeah. think however however we make our presence, whatever tools are there, they need yeah. to be used. And I think John's point was that they need to be used uh, more than well, we that's, have in the past. That's that's the the issue, you know. <laughs> Presence, gonna, presence is power, right? Well, I presence think you also, power. I would say sometimes I thought you hamstrung yourselves by thinking there had to be a coalition buy-in across mm -hmm. disabilities to speak. Mm -hmm. Like there had to be a united mm -hmm. voice. There doesn't have to be a united voice. It, it, it was hearing impaired people, mobility impaired people, cognitive issues. I mean, it can be multiple voices. It doesn't have to be a disability voice. And exactly. I know as things were shifting late last spring, people were saying, well, the coalition hasn't agreed to this. It's like, well, then agree to break off the coalition and have who's ever most impassioned about this particular aspect speak about it. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You know, this happens all the time in, in all our issue areas. And so for the disability community, think they're gonna speak in one voice, kind of dilutes your voice sometimes. Exactly. It, so it's not a monolith. Places. Yeah, coming out. It's at not. It. It's not a monolith, yeah. and and we've found that you know in the equity community, you know, people thinking that we should speak with one voice, and it doesn't. You know, it. We we don't get the bandwidth that we can get when, you know, Ed's in one committee, and can talk on any subject or Debbie Lisi Baker, who I've known for years, you know, can sit in any room and talk on any topic, <laughs> you know, it, it's not monolithic, you know, so, you know, we just need to get out there and do it, you know, that's to John's point, you know, and I guess, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're together on that, I think. Well, I'm going to say that this has been a great conversation, um, and I really appreciate you folks coming in here. I think we've covered a lot of areas, um, maybe more important than the range of the discussion, um, to me anyway, has been the depth of feelings which you folks have shared with us. Um, and so I really wanna thank you very much for your time tonight, but I really wanna thank you for the day-to-day -day work that you do 
um, in, in making this a, a great state to live in. Um, and I know you guys are all, there's always challenges. It's always hard work. Um, but you folks in particular have, have risen to the occasion. So I'll close my part by saying thank you, thank you one last time. And I think that, uh, um, uh, I, I think Steph is gonna take care of, of closing things down. If there's any um, more technical things, Steph, that have to be added before we're, uh, before we're set. Um, we have recorded this, I believe. And so I think that's gonna include the comments that were placed, comments and questions that were placed in the, ch in the chat. So um, thank you all, folks can share it um, and, and have a good night. Aaron Gurbra. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this is Steph, we will be posting this on the VCDR website. So then look for it there. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.